Okay, uh, last week we were we did an introduction to the beginning of, of, of the overview of Sefer Nehemiah. We read the first parak and a little a few psukim in the second parak. Now I'm going to go back to the beginning, pick up a few points on there, uh, and some things in the end of the parak, some things leading into the second parak, and maybe we'll read the rest of the second parak tonight if time allows. Okay, so I'd like you to go back to Parak Aleph for a minute and look at Pasuk Gimel. You remember we met a man named Hanani, who may or may not, more than likely, was not Nehemiah's brother. Um, and he was asked how the deal is, how the situation is in Israel. And he says the following, li. And they said to me, you'll notice, it says they, because not just Hanani came, but then he had other refugees from Israel who were answering this question. Bira'a gedola It's in a very bad way. It's in a very. It's it's just a cherpa. Like you say in English, say in English, busha v'cherpa. The chomat Yerushalayim meforatzet, and the wall of Yerushalayim is breached. Ushareha needs to. I get a bunch of pages to turn, so I get the next word. Probably says ba'ish. Hold on. Ah. I need to use a different printing. I guess not. Um, I don't know where it went. Well, it's probably about ish. You can just assume that it is. Oh, it's probably in the next page. Next column. I have two columns. I looked at the, okay, it's gonna be a long back. But ish. And it is it's and it's being and its walls are not only breached, but there's also the gates have burned in fire. So let's take a look at a couple of comments. Actually, let's look at Pasuk Dawid also. When I heard these words, Yashavti Vaevkit. I sat and I cried, and I mourned for many days. I fasted and I prayed before God. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of points on this. Now, accidentally, I cut off the first line of the slide, so I'll just tell you what it says. I'm going to pick it up here. It doesn't say that there is no wall around Jerusalem, but rather there were breaches in the wall. The wall that surrounded the, the from the time of the, the Beit HaMikdash still was there. Even though there's at least 70 years that have transpired since this time, since the destruction, because we know that the Babylonians also made many Breaches in the wall. And when it's with the pasuk that says in Ezra, the shuriach ashachilu, nirasha olim arishonim ishtadu miyad bevoam takenet chomot ayir. That one of the first things that they did in Sefer Ezra and Perak Dal, the Jews came back from Babel. One of the first things they did was to try to repair the wall of the city. Ulam, however. They did not succeed in, in, in finishing it until the point where the rule, the um, order came down to stop the work. It was a work order stop, which we've talked about. Hmm, let me see something. If I make this small, because I think it's, I cut off more than that. No. Okay. I'll just read it to you from the, from the book I have. Just a minute. Oh, no. Uh, leave it there. So he's saying the first thing he's telling us is not that there was no wall, but that the wall was breached. Why does it seem to be worse? Um, maybe because it looks like the Jews didn't care, or it looks like they were exposed, or a whole bunch of possibilities. But now you'll notice it says that he was, he heard what they said, and then he, he sat down, he went to some form of avelut. Now, if you have the text in front of you, I want you to look back at Pasuk Dao for a minute. And you'll notice it says, the first two words says, Vayhi bishomi'i. It was when I heard. Then you have what's called in Hebrew a makaf, a line. It goes from, you know, just a straight up and down line. Et ma'ela, these words. Now, normally, with the purpose of a makaf in Tanakh, it doesn't appear actually in the text, in the actual scroll, but in the, in the text it would, you look in the Tanakh, you look in the, in the Navi. You will see a line. Normally, it's to separate 
um, two thoughts. It could be to separate two words that could be connected and you don't want them connected. And here, the question is, it doesn't seem to make sense to have a makaf here because it means it was when I heard these words that I sat on the ground. So why is there, it sounds like this, when you read it with the makaf, this, this pause, it says, it was when I heard these words. What's the purpose of that? So let's take a look at what he says. A very interesting um, perspective. Avelut nechemya niret lo kihit paratsut. It would appear that the avelut nechemya shows was not just like all of a sudden you hear this and he just burst out in this terrible crying and upsetness and 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 mourning. It was planned. There's a an expression you will hear sometimes in the education world, uh, sometimes in youth groups and sometimes in schools, not here. Um, planned spontaneity. What is planned spontaneity? Since those two words contradict each other, it means that you you make something appear spontaneous, but it's it's mituchna merosh. You already have it planned. I'll give you an example of how something like that I just heard last week or two weeks ago is is, is amazing. Those of you who are who know Rav uh, Rav Chaim Sabato Shlita Rosh Hashiva here at Berkat Moshe, he has been in education for over forty five years, and Many, many, many times in a shiur, he tells a story. It's part of his modus operandi. He tells stories in shiur, either to illustrate something, to point out something. And he said that even the stories he tells that seem to be like, oh, wait, I got a story to tell you. Like, it looks like he's just now thinking about it. Even those stories he had planned at the beginning to, to tell the story. He had it written down a note to say it. So what's going on here? What does it mean that he planned this? Look in the parentheses, or it says right here. Ulai mishum kach yesh mafsik ben kishomi leet hadvarim. That may be the reason why there's this maka, this this break between kishom bishomi or kishomi rather and hadvarim to indicate that he heard. Then he thought about what he needs to do as a result. It wasn't this instant response. Hu yichlit sheish likba evel al ichur ha'yishua. He, he decided that it was necessary to establish some form of mourning for the delay in the redemption. He's maybe, in, in spite of the fact that many people were still in shock, and I want to read the next, the next thing. I'm not worried about what he said here. You notice there's two things here. One is the makaf. Then it says, Yashavti, I sat. Ulahi shiashav la'aretz, aval efshar ki rak yashav, kide lehit ponenu vitamek, ma shira ulayim bitzachim. He says two possibilities here. Again, if you look at the pasuk, it says, Vayi ki shomi et adri meil. It was when I heard these words, Yashavti va'evke. So on the one hand, it could just be very simple. It, as a result of him wanting to show some form of avilut, he sat on the ground. But the word yashavti has another connotation besides just to sit. It means to sit to think about, to focus on something. Like in Hebrew, we say, doesn't mean we have literally means we have to sit on this. But it doesn't make any sense in English. But what it means in Hebrew is we have to sit and think about it and plan. So also this this bolsters the potentially bolsters his his hypothesis that that uh is had this um plan that he needed to. Show the people that we need to do something here. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he comes down from Har Sinai, we know that he says to Yehoshua, Yehoshua says, um, there's like this noise in the camp. I don't know what it is, what's happening. And Moshe says, En kol anot chalusha, en kol anot gvura, en kol anot chalusha, kol anot uh, something that no, it's not a sign that the noise is not because they're winning a war, it's not because they're losing a war, it's just stam noise. And he comes down from Har Sinai, and Hashem's already prepared him. He says, Your people have messed up. And he takes, you know, he's, he's angry, he takes the Luchot and he throws them on the ground. There's a hundred different perushim of how that happened and what happened, the letters. That's not the point. And he's furious and he's angry and he makes them crush the, the Luchot. And he makes them to, to the, 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 the golden calf and he makes them drink from it and people die from it and all. And what does he do? He turns around and he goes up back to God. And he goes, oh, God, please. 
What do you want from them? They're stubborn people. But what happened is anger. Because in front of the people, and even it says in the first year, that even though Moshe Rabbeinu looked like he was angry, he only did it outwardly. Of course, he was angry uh, for Hashem, for what they did. But also, he was lahamit panim, he was putting on, uh, 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 not an act, chas shalom, but he needed to put on a face, so to speak, in order to have the people understand the gravity of the situation. That's true a lot of times in life. We, we, we want to give across a certain sense of either awe or fear or respect or something. And he's saying this is exactly what that Nehemiah was doing in this particular situation. Okay, so before we come to that slide, if we take a look, he davens in Pasuk Hey and Vav, asking God to have it to listen. In the middle of Pasuk Vav, it says as follows. I'll start from the beginning of Pasuk Vav, number six. Please have your, your ears open, listening, and your eyes open to hear. In order to hear my prayer, the prayer of your servant, that I'm diving to you day and night, regarding your servants, and the fact that we are admitting doing vidui for the sins that we did, and then against you, va'ani and I, uvetavi chatanu, and I. In the house and my father, we sin. For those of you who are familiar with the, the Yom Kippur Avodah, the service of Musaf uh, in the afternoon of Yom Kippur, you'll see something strange. According to the Torah, and we read this on Yom Kippur, what is the order of what happens to Kohen Gadol? What's the first thing the Kohen Gadol has to do before he can start doing the entire Avodah service? It says, Balo Eitzel Paro, he came to his pot. His, his cow, his bull. You don't use cows. And his, his bull stood between the hall and the altar. Tells the direction the animal stood. And it tells us how the Kohen stood and where he faced. And what does he do? He pressed his hands down on the animal. And he, he uh, did his admission. To God, the Chachay Omer. This is what he said: Ana Hashem, please God, Aviti Pashati Chatati Lefanech Ani Uveti. I have sinned. I've transgressed. I, I against you. I in my household. Ana Hashem, please God, Paperna, please forgive us. La Vonov La Pshaim La Chateim Shaviti B'Shapa. What does he do before he asks for Am Yisrael? Before he asks for the Shevet, his Shevet. First thing he does is he asks Hashem for forgiveness. For himself, for his family. That's the first thing he does. And yet over here, what happens? He asks for, for Am Yisrael. He does vidui for Am Yisrael, for the Jewish people, saying they sin. He included himself, but it was really more about Am Yisrael. And then he says, Ani Uveti. Then he says, I in my household. So the question is, why does he do it in a different order? I'll take a look here. Make this a little bigger. First of all, it doesn't say what is he, he did vidui. What exactly was he admitting to God that he did wrong? Because he didn't say anything new. And he used the same terminology that had been used prior in Jewish history. Now, it says, B'nai Yisrael, hikdim et vidui al Yisrael, the vidui shalatzmo. He first said vidui on behalf of the Jewish people, and only then on himself. As opposed to the way it was done in Yom Kippur. So Israel. As the Shaliach of Am Yisrael, the Kohen was told, you first have to do vidui, and only then can you ask for vidui, say vidui and ask for forgiveness before Am Yisrael. But when it comes to a prayer like this, it would be almost a form of showing off. 
if he were to be the one who started off by saying, I, you know, I have to admit what I did was wrong. Why? What's the difference? He's not the Shaliyah of Am Yisrael as the Kohen Gadol was. He is himself. He's a leader, but he's not the Shaliyah. He's not the messenger of Am Yisrael like the Kohen Gadol was. So if he starts talking about himself first, like, oh man, I really messed up. Oh, and by the way, so did Am Yisrael. By putting himself front and center like that, that would not have been the right thing to do. And then it says, Asher Chatan Ulach, Hu Kolel Atzmo Betoch Yisrael, Lefi HaKlal Shekol Yisrael Revi. That he included himself because all Jews are responsible one for another. I know, let me tell you one thing about this. Imagine you're in Shul and it's a regular mincha, Nusuf or Adot Mizrach, or it's Yom Kippur, and you're saying, Ashamnu Bagadnu Gazal. And you're standing next to some great Torah scholar. You're standing, let's say, you're talking, you're standing next to Rav Chaim Sabat of Shlita. In the Beit Midrash, at Birkat Moshe. He's saying, Hashan, Nuba, Gad, Nuba, Zal, Nuti, Baran, Dofi, Velashon, Arave, There are things that you would say, when you think about it, how in the world would he have to say something like this? Okay, so you say, look, it's the Nusach we all say. It's the wording everyone says. It's either this or it's nothing. But we have to understand that when we come before Hashem and Tefillah, we don't just represent ourselves, we're also there representing all of Am Yisrael. How do we know that? Slach Lanu, right? We say, um, that's not a good one to do with. We, all the, the, the brachot in Shmonese are us. Rifa'enu, Slach Lanu, Hashivenu. It's about us, it's not about me. The one time I talk about me is Hashem open up my lips and I can declare your praise. And the very end, the very end of Shimon Esrei when it's done. But bracketed between that, the entire Shimon Esrei, we don't talk about ourselves. You're allowed to show me in other places. We have personal requests, but it's about Am Yisrael. So even though some great Rav or some great Sadek is standing and saying the Vidui, Ashanu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, Gibarnu, Dofi, etc., etc., that it doesn't mean that the person is saying Vidui only for himself, but he's also, Nechla is also including Am Yisrael in that state. And that's what a sense what Nechamia is doing here um, as well. Let me see, I have a note here for something. Right. Okay. Let's go to Pasuk Zion, please. Number seven. I have to turn back to my book. Okay. Now, there's a very strange usage of a word. And I even kind of purposely led you down a path last week. And, and we're going to go a different path now. Chavol chaval lach. The way I translated it last time purposely was we've, okay, chabala is like to, 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 to hurt someone physically, right? We mentioned the word mechabel, terrorist. Um, so what does that mean? What does it really mean? So let's take a look at the next slide. Make this smaller. He's using a word that indicates the concept of destruction. When it comes to the relationship to God, what does that mean? Not that we destroyed God, Hasashalom. Rather, Retzon Hashem Hu Ba'olam Metukan. The desire of God is that the world should be corrected, fixed, Velo Mushchat, and not destroyed. Kamo B'Tfilat Ne'ilah, as we say in Ne'ilah, the end of Yom Kippur, Kilo Tachpotz Ba'ashchatat Ha'olam. You do not want the destruction of the world. The job of the Jews. We say it every day in Aleinu. That's our, one of our goals in this world. And unfortunately, certain movements within the Jewish uh, religion have taken that as their sisma, tikkun olam, thinking that that's what it all takes to be a good Jew. It's a part of being a good Jew. It's not what makes a good Jew only. But part of our job is tikkun olam, right? I, how? How do we do that? We have to act 
What does tikkun olam mean? We have to act in a godly way relative to our munan Hashem, our actions, our mitzvot that have to do with both the individual and also the general populace. Since they didn't go up a level, they didn't work on that. He says that what we did, and again, he's not mefaret. He doesn't go into detail of what they did wrong. But he said what we did was to destroy the world. Not necessarily in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. So let me try and put that into a, a, a different um, perspective. Because I always try to use this a uh, um, an example of spouses. Um, a husband and wife can live in the same home for many years, can mutter the words, I love you, maybe even once in a while show affection, say they do, they appreciate each other. And they can also live in, a, at the same time, they can live in a state of tension where one of the spouses is walking, and sometimes both are walking on eggshells. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to do the wrong thing. But they've been living together for 20 years, for 30 years. And on the outside, to the outside world, everything seems to be fine. But truthfully, what's going on inside that house is it's not a good marriage. It's, it's almost rotten to the core. And it's crumbling inside. What's the, what's the goal in that kind of situation? If a person, if a couple like that wants to go to a, 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 a couple's counselor, to a rab, to a therapist, what's their goal? Well, sometimes the goal is going to be divorce. It's just not working. Not always does it work. But hopefully, more often than not, is to repair the damage. Now, what do you repair the damage? Well, you just tell the person, okay, now start saying, I appreciate you and I love you and bring each other gifts. That's all on the surface. It's what's inside, the feelings and, re and rebuilding trust and whatever else it is. Again, that's what happened over here. This is what happened over here, that whatever the sins of the Jewish people were at this moment, they were internal. They were not doing what they were supposed to do, and they're being called on the carpet for it by by Nehemiah. Okay. He dives to God, and we know that he asks him, I'm going to come back to that slide, and he asks him um, to help him. What's to help? Let's take a look. Skip, please, to Pasuk. Uh, let's just take a look at the last pasuk of the parak. Okay, the last pasuk, which I think is Yud Aleph. Yeah, Yud Aleph. He comes to the crux of the of the the request, and he says as follows: Ana Adonai, Tina Oznecha Kashevet Al Tilat Avdecha Al Tilat Avadecha. Please have your ear listen to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants, meaning himself and Am Yisrael. Achafetzim. Who truly do desire, in spite of the fact they've done sins, in spite of the fact they've been done hashchata, that they destroyed your world by not doing tikkun olam, they do desire to fear you and your name. What's the that's the request? Please be make your servant successful today. And give him into the position of being of rachami, meaning Meaning this person, i.e. the king, Artach Shasta, we're going to see his name in a minute, the next parak, that I should be able to be successful and he should be inclined to listen to me. We don't know what he's going to ask for. We don't know why he's afraid to ask and why he has to go to all these, this trouble of asking God for all this help. And then he kind of throws in at the last minute, four words, the very last four words of the parak. Vani aiti mashkela melech. I was the steward. I was the wine steward for the king. Even though it says mashke, just means drink, but we we understand that to me in general, it means the, like the Saran Ashkim in the story of Yosef, where he was the wine steward. Why such a, throw in just something like that, which seems to be almost an afterthought. It, seemed, it would seem to be like it deserves its own pasuk, something. So I think I have a, a, a uh, I'll use that one slide. Why does Nehemiah tell us he was the wine steward and why in such a passing fashion? You would think that that's a kind of important thing. Um, and why is it part of that pasuk? So let's take a look at two possibilities. The first one is what the Dad Sofrin tells us. It tells us like this. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry. That's not it. Interesting. 
Huh. I didn't put this on the uh, the screen. Let me just greet you what he says, and we look and um, talk about two things here. Kanu moser kibederch agav shayamashkel emel. The dad sofrim says, kind of like he says it just in an offhanded way that he was the wine steward. He should have said this maybe earlier, even in the text. How could have said that he opens up the whole book and it starts off? And he could say, or whatever the words he used. Why is it not there? It makes, makes sense to think or to say. Maybe he was forced into this position. The king had looked for someone that he could rely on, meaning that wasn't going to kill him. And they suggested, they recommended this man named Nehemiah. Oh, or maybe. Maybe it's possible Nehemiah wasn't just the one who overlooked I mean, watched over the drink. Maybe he even was the one who mixed these drinks and made the wine, made the product. Not just for the king. And also for others. From this, he may have become very wealthy. We know he's very wealthy because we know that in, I uh, don't remember what parak, I think it's hay. He will pay ransom for um, for prisoners. And I want to read something to you I came across. Let me just make it here so I can see both my notes here and you at the same time. Okay. I came across something from... from where is it? Herzog Institute, I think. It's possible on the simplest, simplest level that he was saying this kind of as an offhanded thing because it's the bridge to the next parrot. In order to understand the next parrot, how he comes to the king and how he has access to the king and he talks to the king and the king responds to him, it's just simply just that. Like we're making maybe too much of it. But there's another possibility. Nehemiah is also establishing his credentials, his they call bona fides, the influence he has at the very beginning of this whole story. The position of wine steward, butler, was very influential in ancient times. And there's a, the, the, this, this paper brings a, a source for it. I didn't look it up. And sees that also, as I said, Nehemiah was very well off. And so therefore, by identifying himself uh, in this way, that he was the wine steward and he had this access, He's very subtly telling us that he has a lot of political influence and that these connections are going to be very positive for him as not only as he approaches the king with his request, but also throughout the safe. So we go back to the question we had at the very beginning of the chapter was, why does he introduce himself with one name? Uh, uh, he said it's Nechemiah ben Chachaliah. He doesn't have the 17 generations like Ezra had. So he said, more than likely, because he's writing, writing the book, he wants it to be somewhat modest, at least at this point, hopefully. And the ends this parak also with some form of modesty. He says, okay, you know, I'm, I'm the wine steward. So let me tell you a personal story. And by no means on the same, obviously the same plane as um, Nehemiah. I just told the story to someone else today, actually. I have seen over the years, unfortunately, mostly in the States, but here a little bit, rabbis who get themselves into trouble because they think that they're better than other people, that they are God's representative, that they are the ones who hold the true Torah, and that the others are, you know, they have to come to them for questions and that therefore they're much, much more important. And there's I'm not talking about necessarily importance here, but talking about people who get so self-absorbed in their own kavod, in their own honor. I've seen people get, rabbis get ruined by it. When I, I may have told the story, I don't remember. When I became rabbi in Chicago, in the Shoal, about maybe three months later, 
Um, there was the way our shoal was set up was there's the main shoal that was a main a big hallway, and then there was the hall. So in that hall, was we had, we used to have kiddush every Shabbat. And this one Shabbat, again, maybe two months after I became rabbi. So we're talking 1999. And I had a niece who right now is 20. She's already 28. So she's probably like 20. She was at the time, maybe three. And she was coming into the shul after Kiddush. And I was coming to put my talus away. And she came into the main shul with my brother. And she sees me at the front of the shul, you know, rabbi's chair, the front. And she climbs up and sits down in my chair. And my brother said to her, as a joke, you can't sit there. It's the rabbi's chair. She looked up at him and with the innocence of a three-year-old said, it's only Uncle Zev. And I have never forgotten that story because I know I represent what I represent and I teach Torah and I, I, I'm very grateful for the op opportunity to answer questions. I never look at it as a burden. I love it. I love being involved and helping and I can but I also know who I am and I cannot let ever, ever let that. So, oh, because I answer questions, I'm better than someone. So it puts things in perspective. So it's possible. One of the reasons the Chemya is saying what he's saying. Oh, by the way, I was a steward. Like, like I was pretty high up in the food chain. I had a lot of protexia. He's putting it in parentheses because we need to know that, but he just puts it then in there at, at the last minute, just to, to and not to kind of show off. It's a possibility. Rabbi, it also shows us how much he had to give up, how, how how much he stood to lose by abandoning everything and coming to Yerushalayim. Also very, very, very true. Like, because here he had, he could have stayed in, in Galut, tremendous power, tremendous influence he had in the government. Obviously he had, he had as they, we would say, protectia. Um, and he gives, he will be giving it up. That's correct. Very good. Now there's something interesting that if we read as I did, and I did it on purpose last week, and, and, and now I'll say it slower, and you'll see the difference. There's there, there's something that happens between chapter one and chapter two. If I were to ask you, just think about last week when we read this, tell me what happens next. So you'd say, more than likely, without looking at the text, well, then uh, Nehemiah asked the king and said, you know, this here's the problem I'm having, and I need to go to, I need to go to, um, to what's it called, to Israel. And take care of what I need to take care of there. And it pretty much was like, right, he davened and he went to the king. There's two problems with that. Take a look at the first pasuk of the, of the book. It says, When does he, when does he start this book? We know that it's in the 20th year of the reign of Atashachsta, because we know that I read it in the second chapter. It was in the month of Kislev when this occurs, right? Look at the beginning of Perak Bet. It says as follows. It was in the month of Nisan. So let's let's think about that. He starts off in Kislev. Four months later, maybe five, depending on when you know when started the story and this comes to this point. It's months later since he's Davin to God. And by the way, he doesn't go to the king to ask for anything. What happens? We know this because we just saw it last week. The, I'm just going to give you a review because I'm going to be stopping shortly. He, the king sees something's wrong. If you look at that pasuk, let's read pasuk Kalaf. I raised the wine, I put it down before the king. It was like, cool. Like he didn't, you know, I didn't do anything bad. He saw something was wrong. Why do you look despondent or upset? You're not sick. It's an evil heart. So the, the, what I glossed over last time, and I, didn't per, I did purposely, is that at this point, the first thing he's thinking, the king, is that this man, Nehemiah, has it out for him. He's going to over, want to overthrow the kingdom. So then he responded, responded. He responds, why shouldn't I be when the city of my people and the graveyards of my fathers are in ruins right now? And then he asks, he doesn't go to the king after he davened. Firstly, he doesn't go for, for a few months. Then he, when he does, he doesn't ask the king for anything. It's not until the king opens up and says something to him and notices something's wrong that only then does Nehemiah respond. He's reactive, not proactive. 
And yet, if you quickly read the first chapter and, and a couple of psukim, you would think he davens, he goes to the king, he says, here's the deal, I need to go to Israel. And that's not what happens. Lisa's with the question, why not? What was going on during all those months? Why doesn't he go to the king? Why doesn't he just, after he davens, knows, if I ask Hashem, please, 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 I want the, the book I'm selling, please let it be successful. I don't daven like that because whatever's going to be is going to be. But let's assume that I want it to be successful and all. And then I just sit around for six months and don't do anything with it. And then six months later, I start to go out and try to sell it. Well, what, what was I supposed to do in the meantime? I asked God, help me. Do something on your own. And Nehemiah doesn't. So leave it that question of why. We'll have to talk about that. By the way, next week, I'm going to still continue at 7 o'clock. And I'm diving at 8.15 Marv. The only way I can do regular time and have a different uh, 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 7 to 7.45 is... Um, there's there's no meaning at, at, at 7.45 after this week. So we're going to next starting next week, we'll still continue for those you want to know at 7 o'clock. And I'm going to do 8.15 Marv afterwards. Um, and if it runs into problems, people have to leave in the middle. I'll obviously help them understand. In the meantime, have a good evening. Thank you, Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Pleasure and Bye-bye.